James Brown like me. <laughs> Gotta get in the tea. <laughs> you know that famous song where he's like that? Like they do a key change in the middle of it. He's like, you gotta get into D. Down D. You know, you know James Brown. He's not like, yeah. Hilarious. Yeah. Walking off and then like stand up and like come back and greatest <laughs> comeback. Oh no, there's the greatest oh, comeback. A good one. Oh, for a non-sports yeah, one, I gotta remember like, that. Just like <coughs> is he down? Is he up? No, he's back. He's <laughs> back. And I can even show a clip of that. That would be
Good morning. Welcome. Uh, we got some exciting things going on today uh, that I'm happy to share with you. First, uh, we are starting a new series this morning, a new sermon series uh, called Greatest Comebacks. We kind of thought, hey, you know what? Everyone is, uh, a lot of people are coming back to school, uh, coming back to work, you know, um, even people that don't have the whole summer off took, you know, summer vacation. Our, a lot of times our routine changes uh, in the summertime. And so now that it's fall again, we're, you know, ready to come back to our, our regular routine. And so we thought it'd be great to talk about things like that. And so we are going to talk about greatest comebacks, where we look at some of the greatest comebacks in uh, biblical history and what they say to us about how we can come back from situations we find ourselves in. And so you know what that means for the next, what is it, what are we doing, five or six weeks on this, whatever, for the next five or six weeks, it's a sports analogy every week, y'all. Uh, that's right. <laughs> so no, I'm just kidding. In fact, although I, I will use some today, I won't lie. Uh, we are not going to do that every week. We are going to find other things to talk about. Uh, but it should still be a great and uh, fun series. So I hope you will continue to join us for that. Uh, then the second thing, as many of you know, as you're here for that very purpose, uh, today we are doing the teacher commissioning uh, for Holy Cross Lutheran Academy. Uh, and so we are excited to have all of you here uh, that are going to do that. We are going to do that following the opening worship set. So uh, after we sing uh, for a little bit and praise God for a little bit, we'll invite you to come up front and uh, we have uh, kind of a little, if you've done this before, it'll be very similar to what we did last year, uh, a, a little ceremony, a little um, a liturgy that we go through to commission you as teachers, uh, and then uh, we'll pray for you and uh, maybe lay hands on you and some things like that, so uh, it should be good. But that said, every time we do this, uh, I always want to take a moment, and I'm going to do that now, to recognize all teachers, as great as it is that we have such wonderful teachers at Holy Cross Lutheran Academy, we have a lot of other people that are members and faithful attenders here at Holy Cross that teach at other schools, that teach at other private schools, or that teach in the public school. And uh, all of you, wherever you teach, uh, are called to an important ministry uh, and an important task of helping to raise up young people in our society. So I'd like to take a moment to recognize and pray for all teachers right now. So if you are a teacher uh, at Holy Cross Lutheran Academy or anywhere else, please stand up right now, first of all, so we can recognize you. And let me take a minute to pray for you real quick. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of teachers, Lord. Uh, he gives him this uh, robe, a uh, cloak of, of many, like br all these bright colors. And uh, his brothers get jealous. Now, let me ask you if you're willing to be honest for a minute. How many of you that have brothers and sisters have ever had a little sibling rivalry with your brothers and sisters? Yeah, that's most of you, it looks like. Um, how many of you ever thought about murdering them because of that? <laughs> Everyone laughs, but at the 8 o'clock service this morning, I had a couple people go, yeah, I mean, you know. <laughs> Joseph's brothers literally planned to murder him. Uh, one of them, fortunately, realizes that is not the right thing to do, talks them out of it, so instead, they merely sell him into a lifetime of slavery. Uh, and so he gets sent to Egypt. He has some adventures there that we'll talk about a little bit in a minute. But even though things start to look up for him at one point, uh, it doesn't last long, and he ends up in prison in Egypt. So in a lot of ways, things for Joseph go from bad to worse. And I think that's something that we experience in our lives sometimes. Uh, it's not always as dramatic as what's happening to Joseph. It's not always necessarily a, a life-threatening thing. 
But you know, and um, I have a Bible class that I, I lead on Wednesdays um, during the day. Um, so it's at noon. If you can get away for a lunch break, I'd love to have you. But uh, we um, have been going through the book of Ecclesiastes. And in Ecclesiastes, uh, King Solomon talks a lot about work. Um, and he also talks a lot about how life sometimes appears to be meaningless. And we got on that subject of, of, you know, it is kind of a real thing in the human condition, especially nowadays in the modern world that we live in, that a lot of times people will find themselves working in a job that they find meaningless, going to work like day after day, like the stereotype is the person that, you know, goes to work and sits in a cubicle and enters data at a terminal and doesn't feel like they're making any difference in the world, doesn't feel like they're doing anything that matters, that feels trapped, right? Um, That's a real condition that people find themselves in. Uh, How many of you have ever had had to work for a boss that you could not stand? (laughs) Right? Yeah, I remember that. That's right. I mean, no judgments on who that is, Chris, right? (laughs) No, I'm not really his boss anyway. but that happens. Uh, so I remember um, one time I was working, uh, and I, you know, I'm going to try to keep this so you can't quite tell where it was. Um, I don't want to, you know, out anybody over this, but I, I remember one time I had a boss that I worked for that had some real kind of anger management issues. And um, the, he was very tough to work for. And I remember the, the, the thing that happened that was really kind of just indicative of the, his whole tenure, was one day uh, me and another guy that worked there were in what basically passed for the employee lounge, and our, our boss was on the phone with the realtor. I forget if he was buying or selling a house, but it was something, and he was not happy about it. And so he's like literally screaming and yelling at the person on the phone, it, just in the employee lounge, right? He's screaming, yelling at the person on the phone. And finally, he slams down the phone and he turns. And mind you, me and another employee are standing right there. There's like one of those little conference tables with chairs around it. And he kicks the chair as hard as he can. It goes flying across the room and he storms out without saying a word. And uh, me and the other guy just looked at each other like, where are we? Like, what, what is this place? Uh, that we are working at, uh, you know, sometimes you find yourself in a place doing things where, where you feel trapped and you don't feel like there's any way out. You don't feel like there's any way to, to better your situation. And uh, I mean, I think that's common to a lot of people. Um, sometimes it is life-threatening though too. Sometimes it, it are, it, it, they are things that really make a, a huge impact um, in our prayer list, in our weekly, we've got uh, this whole section of people that we're praying for that battle cancer. And um, now I've had people ask me before, like, what's going on at Holy Cross that you have this many people with? These are all people from Holy Cross, but they are people that people at Holy Cross know. And it still shows how many people Uh, are affected by a disease like that, that indeed is life-threatening. And sometimes people find themselves battling an illness, uh, either cancer or something like it, and you find yourself uh, um, in a situation where you, you don't see much hope for a cure, you don't see much hope to get better, you don't know why you got sick in the first place. And that's a tough situation to be in. And in those situations, it's easy to give up. It's easy to kind of cut and run. Uh, Since today's sports day, let me ask you this. How many of you have ever been at a game or maybe you're watching a game on TV and it gets near the end and you don't finish? You get up and leave or you go ahead and change the channel and start watching something else or get up and go mow your yard or whatever because you can already tell how the game's going to turn out. Because you're like, ah, there's only two minutes left. There's no way they're coming back from this, right? So let's just go, let's just give up. Let's just go ahead. We'll leave early. We'll beat the traffic, you know, or we'll watch something else that we wanted to watch. Has that ever happened to you? Because we do the same thing in these situations sometimes. We leave, leave the game early. 
I was, um, got to hear a story about someone recently, and again, it's, if it seems vague, that's just because I'm trying to keep it anonymous, but um, I heard a story about someone recently uh, who, when they were younger, right, they had a, they had a great relationship with the Lord. Um, they went to church, they went to youth group, they read their Bible and all of that, right? Then they got an illness, um, not a life-threatening illness, but uh, something happened to them that they ended up with a physical disability. And because of that physical disability, uh, they couldn't do things most of the rest of us take for granted. And uh, there's, no, there's no getting better. There's no way to fix this. It's just something they're going to be stuck with uh, for the rest of their life. And in that moment, uh, for a while, they, uh, they I, don't, I don't know if they lost their faith entirely, right? But it definitely hurt their faith. It hurt their relationship with God. They quit going to church. They quit reading their Bible. They quit praying because they couldn't understand how God could let something like that happen to them. Now, because I don't want you to leave here today going, oh, that sermon was kind of good, but I feel terrible now. Um, I will tell you uh, that this person experienced their own kind of comeback. Um, they, they've experienced a renewal in their faith. They're back to doing some of those things they were doing before, and they're, they're feeling better about it. But still, that idea that when we find ourselves in such a bad, tough situation, that sometimes we just want to walk away. We want to walk away from the situation. We want to walk away from our lives. We want to walk away from God. We just want to quit it all. That is real. How was Joseph able to go through such terrible situations and not quit? How was he able to go through such terrible situations, uh, having a murder plot by his very brothers that are supposed to love him, uh, being sold into slavery, uh, spending time in prison? How did he go through all that and not despair, not be overcome uh, by that kind of sadness from being in situations like that? Well, we see a bit of the answer in the text that we read today, and I want to redirect you back to it. Um, here's what we just read a few minutes ago uh, in verses 5 and 6. Again, Joseph is speaking to his brothers, and this is what he says. Do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there'll be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. In the next chapter, he says that famous statement to his brothers when recounting his own story, and he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Joseph was able to get through those times because he trusted God because he had faith in God that God knew what he was doing and that God would do something good with it. And here he is now, this is hindsight, right? But now he knows and he sees it's finally been revealed to him what it was all about. It was so he could save lives. And so he could save the lives of his brothers, the very ones that wanted to kill him. Joseph realized that all the stuff he went through <clears throat> all those bad, difficult moments was so that he could be where God needed him to be uh, and do the things that God needed him to do. And that's true for us as well. That's also true about the situations we find ourselves in. I'm not saying that God causes bad things to happen to you, but I am saying that God plans for them. He accounts for them. And he uses them for good. We know that God has a plan for us. We may not always know what it is. Sometimes, especially when you're right in the midst of one of those situations where you're struggling with an illness or you're in that job you can't stand or you think your whole life is meaningless, you might struggle to know, I don't know what God is doing with this right now. 
But you can know he's doing something because the Bible reassures us over and over and over again that God loves us and he cares for us and he provides for us. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says this, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Rest assured, some of the people that Jesus was talking to when he said this were people that were poor. They were people that were struggling to, to clothe themselves. They, they, at least some of them, were people that were struggling to feed themselves. And yet Jesus reminds them that God takes care of all of his creation and you are even more valuable. And so he's going to take care of you too. He has a plan for you as well. And even when we can't see that plan, we can trust in it. Do you know why? Because we've already seen some of his plan and what it does. We have seen his plan for salvation. We have seen his plan to reconcile the world to him through Jesus Christ. His plan from the beginning of time. Uh, he made a prophecy about the coming of the Messiah and the defeat of evil to Eve on the day that she and Adam sinned. And he fulfilled that plan in Jesus Christ. And we have seen that plan fulfilled. We've seen it fulfilled in history, and we've also seen it fulfilled in our own lives because we have seen how God has graciously forgiven us and given us his Holy Spirit to empower us, blessed us with new life, the fruits of the Spirit, joy and contentment and peace and love and kindness and all the rest. We have already experienced that. And having experienced that, we can know and trust that God still has a plan even in the times when we can't see that plan, even in the moments when we're struggling. Joseph realized that. And because he realized it, he was able to keep doing the things that God wanted him to do. And because he did that, God was faithful and worked his plan and blessed him. I love Joseph. He's, to me, a classic example of failing upward, right? Because every time something bad happens to him, he comes back even stronger, even more blessed in the end. He starts out uh, one of many sons, favored by his father, yes, but not looking too good for the inheritance. He wasn't the oldest. Then he gets sold into slavery, but because he's sold into slavery, he ends up going to the house of Potiphar, a wealthy man, and ends up being put in charge of that guy's whole house. And most likely, therefore, became a man of wealth and privilege himself. But then he gets sent to prison because he's falsely accused. And that seems terrible, but from prison, he ends up working for Pharaoh himself, the king himself, and becomes the second most powerful man in Egypt, which was at that time probably the most powerful nation on earth. After going through such terrible things, he rose to heights that no one would have ever expected because he stayed faithful, because he trusted in God's plan and he kept working and doing the things God called him to do. I do like normal sports besides the UFC. I also like baseball. Uh, I'm a St. Louis Cardinals fan. Go Cards. We still got a shot at the wild card this year. Uh, and I've noticed in baseball games and come from behind victories that while sometimes there's, you know, just kind of a lucky thing like the, you know, the grand slam like right in the last inning or something like that. Usually when, when a team comes from behind in baseball, it's not because of just one lucky hit. It's usually because despite the fact that they're behind, despite the fact that the momentum may seem to be with the other team, they keep 
simply playing good fundamental baseball. They just make plays one at a time, and they keep making plays, and they keep doing the right thing, and eventually the momentum starts to shift, and then they score a couple runs, and then another couple runs, and then another couple runs, and eventually they win. That's what Joseph did, and that's what we are encouraged to do. When you find yourself in that moment uh, or in that circumstance where you feel like you're falling behind, where you feel like you're struggling, trust in God and just keep making the plays. Trust in God and just keep doing the work that he has called you to do. Because the secret is and the truth is, that's really who you're working for. Not that terrible boss that you can't stand, but the Lord himself. In Ephesians 6, 7, it says, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. We've said this before, I'm going to say it again today. Your circumstances change. But one thing that never changes is God and his love for you. So continue to place your trust in him and do the things he has called you to do. And you will experience your own great comeback. And in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to give you a few moments to think about that. And while we do, uh, we're going to gather our morning tithes and offerings. Please rise. 
Uh, we come now to the time where we pray together the prayers of the church. If you're a guest or visiting with us today, first of all, welcome. Uh, and second of all, uh, you can find those prayers on the back page of your weekly. Um, you can read along with us as we're praying so that you know kind of who we're praying for and why. We also encourage you to take this home and continue to pray for these people throughout the week. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that indeed um, you are watching out for us. Indeed, you have a plan for us. And Father, we know that uh, there may be times when we struggle, and when it seems like we're falling behind and defeat is imminent. But Lord, we know uh, that you have a plan. And we know that already we are promised victory through Jesus Christ because of that plan. So continue to help us uh, trust in you and continue to do the things you have called us to do no matter the situation. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we know that every good thing we have comes from you, so we are quick to give you our thanks and praise. Father, today uh, we uh, thank you for teachers, uh, for the blessing that they bring. We pray that you continue to give them strength and courage, uh, wisdom and peace and hope. And Father, we pray also today for Mandy. We thank you for the healing that she's experienced, that um, her illness is now in remission. Uh, Lord, continue to be with her as she recovers. Lord, in your mercy. And yet, Lord, we know that there are those moments when we experience loss, uh, especially the loss of a loved one that can be so devastating. And so, Father, we pray that you would comfort those families that have recently lost loved ones, especially the families of Aileen and Richard. Lord, be with them during this time. Lord, we understand their grief, but we do not want them to grieve as those without hope. So continue to give them hope through your Son. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for all those that are sick and in need of hearing uh, and healing, uh, especially Carrie, Brant, Debbie, Teresa, Seth, and everyone that's on our cancer list. Father, indeed, uh, we know that you are caring for them. You do have a plan for them. But Father, we also know you are the great healer. And so, Lord, we pray that you would bring them that gift of healing that they need so much. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, Father, we come before you uh, with all of our other needs, and today we pray for Blair, uh, that you would bring her comfort and peace um, as she is having difficulty uh, grieving the loss of her father. Father, we pray for Gina, that you'd give her guidance and direction uh, as she is moving and looking for a new job. We pray for the Travis family, uh, that you would help them during a time of struggle and give them guidance and direction. And Father, we pray today also uh, for the little six-year-old boy that's uh, gone missing in Sanford, uh, that you would allow him to be found quickly and safely. Lord, in your mercy. Father, all these things we lift before you, uh, and we ask them not of ourselves, but in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, having been fed by the word of God, having been encouraged in fellowship with one another, having been strengthened by the presence of the Holy Spirit, take what you have been given, go forth into the world and share it. In Jesus' name, amen. So with the theme of this school year for Holy Cross being on the move, we're going to talk about God being on the move, and we pray that, that he is moving in you, in your classrooms this year. Sing with us. Hallelujah, God. 
sing it again, God is on the move. Now go in peace and serve the Lord.